welcome to Refuge Community Church. Uh, we're excited, glad you're here, and excited just to, to get together and see uh, what the Lord is going to do this morning, because we expect Him to show up, and because we expect Him to do some things. Uh, I don't have anything, I don't have post-it notes, I don't have anything that I plan to announce. Is there anything on, that we need to announce or share, or anything on your heart before we get rolling this morning? Bible study. Bible study, that's why I make post-it notes. Hey, <laughs> so, the young adult-ish kind of sort of Bible study, Tuesday night at 6 here? Yeah. Okay, Tuesday night at 6 here, and there is no uh, age limit on that, so if you feel like a young adult, or you feel like studying the Bible and, and getting together to see what the Lord does, then you can come and be here Tuesday night at 6, and Jake and Caitlin are going to head that up and, and lead us, and we're going to start in the book of Jonah, so you can kind of just prepare it and, and be ready that direction. Tuesday night six. Anything else? Yeah. Hearts and minds are clear. Everybody's good. All right. Um, I'm going to pray for us. And then after I pray, there's just a little intro video. It's like 58 seconds to kind of get our, our mindset and where we're going today. And then we're going to uh, enter into uh, a time of, of praise and worship. So, Jesus, we thank you this morning. We get to come. Thank you for what it means when we come. And so, Jesus, as we come together this morning, we're going to give you our praise and our worship. We're going to declare who you are. We're going to tell about who you are. We're going to sing who you are. We're going to say who you are because you're worthy of every word of praise and every song of worship that we could give you and so much more. And so we're going to give you everything we have this morning because we, we expect and we rest on the promise of your word that you're going to settle down on and, and rest on and dwell on the praises of your people. So, Lord, as we begin to praise, as we begin to worship, would you just come into this place this morning and have your will and have your way this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As well as many other verses, tell us to praise God with all of our heart. Heart in the Bible means the center or deepest parts of our emotions. So if we are praising God with all of our heart, then we are praising Him with all of our emotions. David said that he danced before the Lord with all of his might. He leaped and jumped, clapped and raised his hands, shouted his praise with a voice of triumph, and praised God with everything that was within him. We sing it in our prayers. We even sing it in our songs. Isn't it time that our actions prove that we really do praise God with all of our heart?
Yes, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. We thank you, God. You call us great, God. Jesus, we love you, Jesus, God. We thank you, Father. We glorify you, God. We really kind of
break things up a little. We're going to break out of habits and old wineskins and the way we think things have to happen. So we're not done with praise and worship. We're just going to do most of it after the message instead of before the message. So we're in a, a series where we've been looking at for the last several weeks. This is week five. And in this series, we've called it Keys to the Kingdom. And so we've been looking at it and we've been thinking about what are the keys? Right? If, 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 if the kingdom of God is something we long for, if Jesus told us to pray uh, for His will to be done, His kingdom to come, right? His will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then what do we do, right? What are the things that we can do to help usher in the kingdom of God? If, if we really believe that He wants to bring a little bit of heaven to Neon, a little bit of heaven to, to Letcher County, what are the keys that, that we can do? What are the things we can do to be a part of that, because we we, we, we we kind of made a declaration last week, right? We said, as a church, we will be a church. We will be a, a group of people who go after His glory, who go after His manifest presence above all else. And so what are the things we can do that can really help to bring that in? This morning, I want to talk to you about our fifth key to the kingdom, and it's praise. If we're going to see the kingdom of God ushered in, we're going to be a people of praise. God's going to get the praise He deserves and He's going to be honored and revered and magnified in a group of people and in a place before He really begins to move and manifest power in that place and among those people. And so as we look over the Bible, that word praise, depending on the translation of the Bible that you look at, it appears over 200 times in the Bible. In the King James Version, I think it's like 252 times that it appears. It's, a, it's over a hundred times just in the book of Psalms, right? It's, it's all throughout the Bible. It's one of those words that we grow up in church and we hear. We praise and worship. We praise the Lord. Praise, 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 praise. But I'm not always convinced we even know what in the world we're talking about, right? Well, praise the Lord, we say sarcastically when something happens here or there, right? And we, we, we use this word, but I'm not convinced we understand what it is. And I'm definitely not convinced that the church in the 21st century understands the power that's in praise. That, that what can happen when we really do begin to praise. And so as you, as you go back and we take some of our English words that are translated in, as praise, and you go back to look in the original language and see what they meant, here are some biblical synonyms for praise. Bless, exalt, extol, glorify, magnify and thank. When we begin to praise God, it becomes all about Him. When we begin to praise Him, we bless His name, right? We exalt Him. That means we put Him in the highest place, right? We say, Lord, I'm taking myself off the throne and I'm exalting You. I'm putting You in Your proper place where You belong. We glorify Him, not ourselves. We magnify Him and not ourselves. We thank Him and not other people. And so, first of all, if we're going to ask this question, the first question I want us to, to look at this morning is, what is praise? If we're going to look at that question this morning, the first thing I want us to understand is that to praise God is to call attention to His glory. So to praise God is to call attention to His glory. Jake, if you click that next slide over in Psalm 115, I want to read you three different verses. Verse 1 and then verse 17 and 18. It says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to Your name. Give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Then down verses 17 and 18. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol or praise the Lord now and forevermore. So, so to praise the Lord is to give Him the glory. It's to give Him the honor. It's to give Him the magnifying. It's to give Him what He really does deserve. Which means i got to humble myself. Yeah. It's not about me. It's about Him. It's not about what I've done. It's what He's done. It's not about what you've done. It's what He's done. It's not about my problems. And it's not about my job. And it's not about my family. And it's not about my circumstances. It's about a King of kings and a Lord of lords. It's about a holy God who's yes. worthy of my praise. And He's worthy of everything yes. I could ever yes. say about Him. No matter what's going on in my life. It's all about Him. And so I begin to point to Him. When I begin to praise, I start putting my attention on Him. I start pointing other people to Him. We start to focus in on Him. It's not, would you look at this? Would you look at that? Would you look at them? It's look at my Jesus. Look at my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And I start to bless His name. And I start to talk about what He's done. And I start to tell of His wondrous works. And I start to tell of His deeds. And I start to use words that describe His character. And I start to use the names of God. And before I know it, I've forgotten about my problems because it's all about Him. 
I am. Amen. I've forgotten about my circumstances. I've forgotten about my circumstances. You're like, God, you cannot. You cannot worry and praise at the same time. Your mind will focus on those two things. You can't be double-minded like that. When you start to praise Him, you begin to leave behind those worries. And you begin to leave behind fear. And you begin to leave behind those inhibitions. And you begin to leave behind the things of earth that bog you down. And you start to praise Him. So to praise God is to call attention to His glory. Second thing, praise is both a duty and a delight. In other words, it's a responsibility, but it's also a reward. It's a job, but it's also a joy. Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4 say this, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. You see, we have a responsibility as the people of God. It's not optional for us to praise God. It is a responsibility for us to praise God. Guys, if He has redeemed you, we just sang two songs about it. If He set you out of the grave and redeemed you with His mercy, we have a reason to sing. There's a purpose behind it. We have a duty to do it. It's our job as the church to praise His name. It's not our job to look to somebody else to do it and say, I'm not wired that way. It's our job as the church to give Him the praise that He deserves. It is a duty, but it's also a delight. It's not something that weighs on me and says, well, i got to praise the Lord today. It's a delight. I get to praise because what happens when I praise? His presence comes. What happens when I praise? The worries begin to melt away. What happens when I praise? Freedom begins to come. It's a duty, but it's also a delight. I get to experience my Jesus as I begin to So Yeah, we have to. We have to. We have to praise Him. We have to magnify Him. We have to speak out what He's done. We have to get out of our comfort zones and do it for Him. But also, not we have to. We get to. I get to praise Him. I get to talk about my Jesus. I get to experience Him. I get to feel His power. I get to have His anointing. I get to have His presence with me. So it's a duty, and it's a delight. Now, let's go ahead and take our boxes and our comfort zones for this next one, and you just... Because I'm going to... We're going to shake up some paradigms. Third thing that I want you to know about praise is it is outwardly... Demonstrated. Amen. It is a visible expression that can be seen or heard. And that in the Bible, praise is almost always accompanied by a physical expression. Praise is not something I suppress and hide. Praise for the God of the universe is not something that I say, Oh, he's so deserving of praise. Praise Jesus. Right? Amen. Because how many things in life would you feel the need to hide your excitement? How many things in life would you feel the need to calm yourself down about so you don't look too foolish, right? I've said it a dozen times, but I'm going to say it again. If you won the lottery this morning, what would your reaction be? If you won the lottery, and I'm not encouraging you to play, but if you did, right? If you just didn't know it, that'd be a tie right there. But if you, if you did win the lottery, building fun. I can get this train <laughs> If you did win the lottery and you check your numbers right and bam, 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 bam. When that Powerball matched, I have a feeling he would not say, well, that's amazing. <laughs> that's <Jesus. laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You'd act a fool, right? And you might be in your living room and it might be on 11 o'clock news, but I have a feeling everybody in your neighborhood would know pretty soon. Because you begin to scream and shout and welp and wail and do whatever you do when you get excited in that moment because you wouldn't care. You'd be too excited about what you got. Yes. What if we got that excited about what we got? Come right? Come on, guys. I, I mean, yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome to have a mansion and this and that and things in this life. But they're only going to last 70, 80, 90 years and then they're gone. What we've got is of eternal value. Right? But yeah, we've got home in heaven, but we also get a life here where we get to live and, and, and have the Spirit of God inside us and experience His power and experience His glory, and we get everything we need to live this life in victory, and then we come together in church and we say, well, praise the Lord. What if we have a lottery winning reaction? Or, <coughs> ball games, right? And I don't care if we're talking about Martha Jane Potter, I don't care if we're talking about Neon Middle, I don't care if we're talking about Jenkins, LCC, UK, NFL, NBA, I don't care what it is, when there's a big game, You'll find people acting a fool, myself included, right? I mean, I wore a hole around our living room pacing in 2012. I wore it in whatever year we lost to Wisconsin, too. That's a different <laughs> but, 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 
and, and man, let me tell you, when I was in Rupp Arena, when we played North Carolina, Anthony Davis here, into the game, we're up. He goes over, blocks their game in a shot. And, <laughs> I'm just glad we got the fame came on me. Because <laughs> I acted a fool, right? Because I had, my team had victory. And then we come to church. Or I've got victory. I can have more victory. And I say, Or, I just sit down and say, look, they stopped singing already. <laughs> Praise the Lord! He's worthy of yeah, He's deserving. Yeah, he yeah. gave us victory. Yeah. He gave us way more victory than Anthony Davis did, or John Calipari did, yeah. or Randall Cobb did, or Bill C.C. did. But he gave us way more victory than, than any of that. And yet, we just feel like we need to like have a muffler. It's Jesus! It's the God of the universe! Why do we hold back there and let everything else go? Yeah. Or what if this morning, what if a celebrity walked in that door, right? My goodness, a property brother came to White's <laughs> And y'all, I couldn't teach my seventh grade class because they were fangirling. Oh my goodness, he's in the kitchen. It was like 13 minutes after the dude walked in, he did not know what he got himself into. Because when somebody snaps a picture and puts it on Facebook, the whole town knows. And the whole town tries to get in the presence of that property brother. And yet we come together. And we have the presence of an almighty God, and it's just normal to us. Wow. Oh, we're going to come in, we're going to praise and worship. The God of the universe is going to come and meet with us and bring liberty and freedom and set us free and save and deliver and do all this stuff. Well, praise the Lord. It doesn't make sense if we really stop to think about it. Right? And it doesn't make sense that, that we have the reaction that we do. Now, I'm not saying come in jacked up on Mountain Dew and Red Bull and just act a fool to act a fool and be emotional. But I am saying don't feel like you need to suppress. Don't feel like you need to put a muffler on or a pause on or hold yourself back or hold yourself in. You give Him the praise that He deserves because He's worthy of everything we can give Him and so much more. And so praise, as we look at it biblically, it's outwardly demonstrated. It's a visible expression. It can be seen and heard. And more often than not, when we look into the Bible, it's accompanied by a physical expression. Right? I want to run down through with you some of those. I'm going to teach you a minute. I want to run down through some of the physical expressions that are mentioned in Scripture that can accompany praise and show you they are biblical, they are acceptable, they are in order, and I dare say they're expected by God. Let's work our way up. Let's not start with crazy stuff. First one, stand. What? You mean we can stand up, right? When a judge enters the courtroom, what do we do? We stand up. Why do we stand up? Because we respect and we revere and we honor that person. And yet somebody asks us to stand up for worship and we say, it sure has been a long week. We stand and we honor the one who we're praising and the one who we're worshiping. Psalm 33, 8 says this, Let all the world stand in all of Him. Let all the world stand in all of Him. So, 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 a physical expression of praise can be standing. Don't use that as a pop out. Everybody else is saying, look, I'm biblical. I'm standing. I'm praising. Don't, don't stop there, but it's a good starting point. Another one. Clapping our hands. Right? And I know we struggle with the rhythm sometimes. To clap our hands. So, <laughs> that can, I mean, that can be like... But... What do you do when you get victory tomorrow? Woo! And you start clapping your hands. What do you do? What do you do if you win the lottery? Woo! I imagine you probably clap your hands. And then we get victory in church and it's... Woo! Praise the Lord. You can clap your hands in praise to Him. Right? Psalm 47 1 says, Clap your hands, all ye people. It is a visible, outward, physical expression of praise to clap in praise to God. Now let's go radical. Marching is a physical expression of praise. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. But if you look in Joshua 6, 2 through 5, right? Joshua and the Israelites going around Jericho, right? They were marching. And they wasn't just like, I mean, they're marching in praise. They're declaring praises of God. They're, they're doing what God told them to do. Dancing is a physical expression of praise. Multiple, multiple places we can see it. We see it in Psalm 149.3, right? Where it says real simply, praise Him with the dance, right? We're supposed to praise Him with the dance. We can dance before Him, right? If I can dance to Maroon 5, I can dance for Jesus, right? If I can dance to Sunday best, I can dance for the Lord of Lords, right? It's okay. It's not out of order. It's not outlandish. We've made it 
Uh, we've made it unordinary in the modern church, but it didn't used to be. Amen. 2 Samuel 6, 14. David is bringing the ark, which means the presence of the Lord, back into Jerusalem. <laughs> now he got out of the ordinary. Because he danced. He danced. He danced. Those clothes fell off. <laughs> Ain't nobody encouraging that, right? You go <laughs> in everything real tight and get everything covered up before you dance. But you can dance for the Lord. What we're doing right now, you can laughter is a form of praise. Yes. Not, not in mockery. But I've had moments where he's been so good and I've been just like, and I just laugh in, 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 in response to Jesus. Psalm 126 too. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our mouths with songs of joy. Psalm 134.2 says this, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Lifting our hands is an outward expression of praise to an almighty God. Bowing or kneeling is, is a form of a physical expression of praise, right? Uh, Psalm 95.6 says, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the God, uh, our maker. Falling prostrate on our faces before him is a physical manifestation of praise. We talked about it last week in, in 1 Kings 18.39. That Elijah has this confrontation with the, the, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And they act a fool all day and their God does nothing. And Elijah makes a little fun of them. And then Elijah just... Pour, pour water over the altar and whatever. And he asked the Lord to come. The Lord comes, fire falls. And he said, everybody fell on their faces and cried out, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Tears are, are a physical manifestation of praise. Right? Psalm 126, 5 says, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. There are times when I praise, when I'm just overcome, when I start to think about who He is and where He brought me from and what He's done for me, that the tears just come. That's a physical, outward manifestation of the praise that I'm releasing to Him. Shouts are a physical manifestation of praise. It is through the Psalms like crazy that, that we are supposed to shout with joy, shout His goodness. We're supposed to shout to the Lord. And then somebody actually does it and we're like... What would we do in a ball game? If we had a ball game, a team scored a touchdown, and somebody let out a big woo! We wouldn't even turn our head. Somebody does it in church, and we're like, what happened to them? <laughs> They're praising the Lord in a biblical way, the way it's written out over and over and over throughout God's Word. So that's what praise is. Praise is essentially giving God the recognition that He deserves in a vocal often physical way. And praise means that God is truly exalted above all else, including our pride and our traditions. Amen. Right? Praise is, I'm, He's God. And so I'm going to give Him what He deserves. And if that means I have to say it out loud or I have to move or I have to do something physically with my body, I'm going to do it because He's God and He's more important than my feelings or my pride or my fear or my insecurity or the way Mamaw did it. He's more important than all of that. So I'm going to exalt Him above all else. So that's the first question this morning. What is praise? And I hope we've got an understanding of it. But if we stop there, it would just be like we had vocabulary time, right? I went into teacher mode and we had a word ball and now we know what praise is. But the second question is this. Why does praise matter? If that's what praise is, why, is it, why does it matter that I praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? We're going to look at three or four case studies this morning. And we're going to look at what the Word teaches us uh, about praise. So the first place I want us to look is in 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. And we're going to read, oh, quite a bit. We're going to read down to verse 28. It says, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Munites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Right? Have you ever felt in your life like there was something waging war against you? Have you ever felt in your spiritual journey like, man, there is something just bam, relentless, bam, relentless, bam, something waging war against you? Pay attention to this if you have. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, an army, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Side note, what does Judah mean? Praise. praise. Right? He proclaimed a fast, literally, for the people of praise. So they start out, they're going to fast. And so the people of Judah, and Judah means praise, came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek Him. 
Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, <coughs> Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sort of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. So here we've got a group of people. We've got the people of God. We've got the people of Judah. And so they have someone who's coming literally to wage war against them. And the first thing they do is proclaim a fast. And then they say, we're going to get into the court. We're going to get into the presence of God. And we're going to stay there. Right? And we're going to cry out to you in our distress. And then they, in confidence and expectation, say, and you will hear us and save us. Verse 10. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession? You gave us an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. They didn't have the answers. They didn't know what the response was. They knew God was going to deliver them. And so they said, God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jehu, the son of Mad, I believe I didn't the past, but he took these. And he said, verse 15, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Can I tell you this morning, if you feel like you're under attack, if you feel like someone or something is coming against you, stop feeling like you've got to have all the answers. Stop feeling like you've got to undergird yourself and take up everything you've got. You've got to fight it on your own. Heed these words. Claim these words that were given to the people of Judah, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. He says, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. You don't have to fight the battle. Stand firm in the deliverance that the Lord has for you. You don't have to fight this thing on your own. Stay in His will and stay obedient to Him. And let Him do the fighting and bring the deliverance and bring the freedom for you. So verse 18. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. Hmm, that sounds like one of those physical manifestations of praise we talked about. And all the people of Jeru Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korites stood up and praised the God of Israel with a very loud voice. So now it's time to do battle. It's time to go in. It's time for the battle that the Lord tells them they're not going to have to fight. And so what they do, they start to praise, right? They weren't down doing push-ups. They weren't stretching. They weren't listening to hard and heavy metal and jumping up and down and screaming and chest bumping. They started to praise. They started to praise when it was time to find the victory. And so verse 20, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. And after the consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of, the, of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. So they already don't have the biggest army in the world. Then, Je then Jehoshaphat says, You know what? All you guys, your designated job is going to be you're going to praise and you're going to sing to the Lord. Well, okay. Right? And so they go into battle with a group of people who are literally praising and singing to the Lord as they go into this battle. Verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, 
the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. I want you to catch something. When they started to praise, they got the victory. When they started to praise, something shifted, and things that didn't make sense began to move and shift, and they got a victory that was improbable and didn't make sense. When they began to praise, victory came their way. Can I tell you this morning, if you will begin to praise in the problems instead of whining and complaining, if you'll begin to declare who He is and stand firm in the presence of the Lord, and you'll begin to praise Him even when it doesn't make sense, you'll begin to praise Him even when you don't feel like it, you'll begin to praise Him because He's worthy of it and not what your circumstances are based on, you'll find victory just like these people did. 23, the Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went on to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baracha, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Ju Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. Didn't make any sense for them to win. Especially when they started pulling dudes out of battle and saying, your designated job is going to be to praise. Your designated job is going to be to declare who God is. But here's what the first thing I want you to realize about why praise matters this morning is praise unleashes victory as God fights for us. Praise unleashes victory. And I don't know how many people I have talked to in the church, not necessarily this church, but the Big C Church in the last few years, and they say things like, I just can't get the victory. I just can't get past that. I just can't get over that. I just can't get through that. Sometimes we need to do what the people of Judah did in this situation, and we need to praise our way to victory. Because praise will unleash victory. As we begin to declare who He is, He will come in just like He did there, and He'll begin to fight our battles for us. So praise unleashes victory as God fights for us. Do you need victory this morning? Is there a situation, a thing, an issue, a, an addiction, a habit, a mindset, a stronghold? Is there something in your life this morning that you need victory over? Maybe God saved you this morning with a spotlight. If you would praise, you'd have victory. If you praise through it, you could have victory over that thing in your life. Second place I want us to look, and this is maybe the familiar thing if we're going to talk about praise, is in Joshua 6, right? In Joshua 6, we read about Joshua and the children of, of, of Israel and, and, and the walls of Jericho. And so when we start through chapter 6, it says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred. The walls of the city of Jericho had been built thousands of years before. And it was one of, the, one of the oldest cities in the world. It was one of the most fortified cities in the world. So don't lose sight of the fact that when we talk about the walls of Jericho, right, this was not like chain link fence. This was not like Tim and Tula and Taylor and Wilson with that little like wooden fence that they had. This was a wall, right? This thing was 25 feet high and 20 feet thick. Right? It was a fortress. It was heavy. It was, it was a big time deal that there was. So when it says that the walls of Jericho were securely barred, they were securely barred. You could stand up on top of the walls of Jericho and you could see for miles. And that's what their soldiers would do. So the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one come in, came in. Right there in verse 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered. That's past tense. That's already happened. It's already done. He doesn't say, I will deliver. He doesn't say, I'm going to think about delivering. He doesn't say, I might deliver. He says, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Can I tell you this morning, you already have the victory. Right? God, God, Jesus already died on the cross. The victory has already been won for you. When are we going to praise through it? When are we going to praise to a point that we receive and walk in the victory that Jesus died to give us? I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. 
When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpet, have the whole army give a loud shout. Hey, there's one of those physical manifestations of praise that we talked about. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and take everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, right, represented the presence, the glory of God. Take it up, and having seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city, with an armed guard going ahead of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard had followed the ark. And all this time the trumpets were sounding. When Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout! So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to the camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and then the rear guard followed in the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh day, Time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city that all and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all that were with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we, we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and took the city, and they devoted the city to the Lord. Second thing I want you to realize is that praise can bring down even the strongest of walls. Amen. Even the strongest wall can come down and praise. And here's the thing, guys. I think some of you have given up after six days around Jericho. Right? You yes. say, well, I'm going to praise and the walls will come down. I'm going to praise and the walls will come down. I'm going to praise the one. After six days, it didn't happen. And you said, well, forget that. <laughs> Your seventh day is right here. And God is telling you, if you will praise, if you will lift up a shout, if you'll begin to declare who I am and give me the praise that I deserve and not care what anybody else thinks and not care how anybody else looks at you, I'll give you the victory that you're after. I'll break down the walls in your life no matter what they are. And guys, sometimes we got some walls up. We got some walls up around our hearts. We got some walls up in our minds. And they've got us so bogged down. Remember what it talked about there in that first or second verse about the walls of Jericho? Nobody came in and nobody went out. We got walls around our heart, walls around our mind that nothing can come in and nothing can go out. It's just stagnant. It's just dead. And if we begin to praise, those walls can come down. If we begin to lift up a shout, those walls can come down. Even the strongest of walls, no matter how long they've been there, no matter how fortified they are, no matter how much we believe those lies, they can come down if we'll begin to praise. They can be torn down if we'll begin to praise. But you know what? I'd imagine there were some people in the camp of the Israelites who said, Joshua God lost his mind. He says we're going to walk around the wall for six days, and we're going to walk around the seventh time on the seventh day, and we're going to shout, and this 25-foot high, 20-foot wall is going to fall down. Okay. Yeah, okay. And I tell you, there will be people who will detract from your praise. There will be people who say, you're going to get victory like that? Okay. You need to, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do something. Sometimes we got to do what doesn't make sense. Yes. Sometimes we got to do what the world doesn't understand. Yes. Sometimes we got to do what the church doesn't understand. Yes. And we got to begin to praise Him in the midst of those circumstances because our walls falling down is more important than our reputation falling down. Right? It's more important that the walls and the things that constrain and bind and restrict me fall down than it is that you think I'm a fine, upstanding, refined gentleman. Right? Sometimes I just got to praise Him and I got to have the freedom that I need. Now, there are some of you this morning who will say, well, this is Old Testament battle stuff. That's different now. It's not, we're in a new cup. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. It's about time we started looking like the book of Acts. Let's read a little bit of it. So in Acts chapter 16, we got a real familiar story, starting with verse 16. It's Paul and Silas. 
there in prison. Once they were going to the place of prayer, or once we were going to the place of prayer, and we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized, right, Paul cast out this Spirit, so now she can't do the stuff for them that, that she was doing that was making them money. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. And sometimes people get real upset when you give freedom to the captives. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept their practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they went from just a few verses earlier, they're out there proclaiming liberty to the captains, they're casting out spirits, they're sharing the gospel, people are getting saved and filled and delivered, and things are going great. And then the crowd gets upset. So they, they cast the spirit of this girl that she could use to see the future, and they were making money off of it, so they say, no more of that. So they have Paul and Silas thrown in jail. They're not just thrown in jail. They're put into the inner cell, right? They have their feet fastened in stocks. They're, they're in the place where the hardened criminals go, right? And so they'd have these, these two boards and these iron clamps on their feet, so they weren't going anywhere, right? This is, this is the one. They were, they were bound down to where they couldn't even move. <laughs> or so they thought. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Hello! They're in the innermost part of the prison. They were doing it. They were doing right. They didn't do anything wrong. They were preaching the gospel and setting people free. And they ended up in prison for it. And their response was to pray and praise. Their response when they were in the prison, their response when they were somewhere they didn't deserve to be, was to begin to declare the goodness of God. Hello! They start to praise and they start to worship. And I imagine they probably started to shout. I imagine they started to declare the promises and the goodness of God. I imagine they raised their arms as much as they could. I imagine there was physical manifestation to their praise. And then it says, and the other prisoners were listening to them. When you start praising in the midst of your circumstances and it doesn't make any sense at all, the world's going to look at you. And the world's going to say, I don't know what they got. But if they can praise in what they're going through right now, I want that. And they're going to be drawn to what you have. Next verse. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open. I want you to notice what an atmosphere of praise is. <laughs> if Paul and Silas praising created an atmosphere where everybody could be free. Do you realize what can be dependent on your praise? Do you realize what can be riding on your obedience and praise and worship? Paul and Silas, two guys, start praising and declaring the goodness of God and worshiping Him in this moment. All of a sudden, every prison door is open and all of them are set free. What if, what if, what if we begin to praise and worship? What if we stick the flag in the ground and said, you know what? We're going to praise God. We're going to praise Him regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on horizontally. We're going to look vertically and we're going to praise Him. And what if we created an atmosphere where our praise began to usher in the presence of God in such a way that all kinds of people could be free? We don't understand what can ride on our praise and on our worship. <laughs> Not only did all the prison doors open, look at the next part of the phrase, and everyone's chains came loose. Ooh. Two guys, Paul and Silas being obedient to praise and do what they're called to do, do what their duty is as Christians. Now everybody's doors came open and <laughs> everybody's chains came loose. I really want to see everybody's chains come loose in so many different ways. I want to see everybody's chains come loose. I want to see people come find freedom. And if I'm reading this right, if I'm reading this biblical account and this biblical explanation correctly, then we've got to praise. We've got to have a group of people. Might not be everybody, but we've got to have a group of people who are going to praise if we're going to see everybody's chains come loose. Verse 27. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoner had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. Jailer wakes up, right? 
He, people back there singing and shouting. He fell asleep. And all of a sudden there's an earthquake and the doors are open and the chains are off. And everybody's free. And he says, well, I had one job. So I might as well take my life because they're all free. And I'm, I'm done for now. And Paul says, no, wait a second. Don't do that. We're all here. Nobody went anywhere. We're in the presence of God. We don't want to leave. We're free. Right? But we don't want to run away from it. We want to bask in the presence of God. 29. The jailer called for the light. <laughs> Y'all turn the lights on. I want to see what's going on here. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what, I, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his house were baptized. The jailer brought him, them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had become to, come to believe in God, he and his whole household. What? You ever thrown a, you ever thrown a rock in the, in, the, in the water and watched? When you throw a rock in the water, it doesn't just go, boom. What comes out from it? Ripples. <laughs> there were some ripples in Paul and Silas. <coughs> they didn't even understand all the ripples that were going to come off their praise, right? You know what? We're in jail for, for serving the Lord, but we're blessed, we're persecuted, so we're going to praise the Lord and pray. And all of a sudden, pfft, Earthquake, doors are open, chains are gone, people are free. Jailer's about to kill himself. And they say, no, 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 dude, don't do that. And then he gets saved. His whole household gets saved. He pulls them into his house, makes a meal for him. He's just praising Jesus. He wants to get baptized in the middle of the night. Revival breaks out in the jailer's house. Because two people were obedient in praise. What would happen if 20 people were obedient in praise? What would happen if 50 people were obedient in praise? What would happen if a whole church was obedient in praise? What kind of atmosphere could we really start to create? So from this, I want you to realize praise sets every prisoner free and breaks every chain, right? There is no prisoner that cannot be liberated in the presence of God. There's no chain that can't be broken in the presence of God. We need a revival in the church that comes when we say, you know what? I'm not going to try to hold back. I'm not going to try to just stand here prim and proper and, and just say the words on the screen. If I feel a response to the God of the universe, I'm going to let it out. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to lift up a shout. I'm going to clap because I've got victory. I might move around vertically. I might move around horizontally. But horizontally. Horizontally. <laughs> and excited. I'm going to give him the praise that he deserves no matter what. And that's going to give me freedom. But what I see in this story is it can create a corporate freedom. Praise can create a corporate freedom in an atmosphere of people. Do we want that? Or do we want church as usual? Do we want a, an atmosphere of freedom where the presence of the God of the universe falls yes. and prison doors are open yes. and chains are broken off and people are set free and people walk in addicted and they leave free yes. and people walk in headed for divorce and they walk out unified yes. in Christ yes. where people walk in with homes divided and they walk out free where people walk in prodigals and they walk out followers of God. Do we want freedom yes. or do we want church as usual? Yes. Yes. Do we want freedom or do we want church as usual? We want freedom. As a church, we want freedom. Freedom is what we're here for. Freedom is what we long for. Freedom is what we need. Freedom is what they need. Church as usual, we've tried long enough. Right? Church as usual has left us more bound than free. Because then we get bound up in church as usual. That's kind of counterintuitive and ironic. But that's what we've done. I want freedom. So how do we get there? We praise. Psalm 22, 3. One simple verse says this. You are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. What do you do on a throne? What does a, what does a king do on a throne? He sits right down on that thing. He sits right down on our praises, meaning he rests on, he dwells on, he comes down on the praises of his people. You see, when God's people praise, he comes. And when he comes, he does the miraculous. When God's people praise, He comes. And when He comes, He does the miraculous. I'll never forget. Man, the Lord has made me into a different person than I was when we started this church. That's okay. We, you know, we, we went to a prayer conference that the Mike Adams had invited us to. We didn't know what the world we were walking into. We just up and flew to Dallas and got a hotel room and went to this conference with all these people we didn't have heard of and met. And we walked into the first service. And we get there. We thought, we'll get there early and get a seat. <laughs> no, we won't. We got there an hour early, and there was like six rows of people back at the altar just crying out to the Lord in praise and worship. And we thought, okay, this is going to be something. And so the service starts, and, and people begin to praise. People begin to actually praise. Right? 
People didn't just begin to like restrain and hold back. But, and that's fine. But people begin to actually praise. People are lifting their hands. People are shouting. People are moving. People are active. People are on their knees. People are on their faces. People are praising the Lord. And I think we had sung two songs. And the host pastor who had just like opened up and woke up, he comes running up to the front, dragging this old man. And I'm like, okay, what are y'all doing? And he, and he pulls this old man to the front. And I think his name was Richard. And he says, Richard, tell your story. And Richard said, I came in today. And I was deaf. I couldn't hear out of this ear. And as we were praising and worshiping, my ear just went and opened up. And I could hear perfectly all of a sudden. Nobody laid hands on him. Nobody. And the Lord works that way too. But in this instance, he wasn't singing after him. He was just praising the Lord. He was just in the, in the corporate body who was, who was praising the Lord. And as people began to praise the Lord, the presence of the Lord was unleashed. And he got something he wasn't even asking for. His ear opens up and he can hear. Right? He had like 90 some odd percent hearing loss. Like he couldn't hear it all out of his ear. And all of a sudden, like they were like tasting it. And they're like, it's pretty. He heard everything. Because when God's people praise, He comes. And when He comes, He can do the miraculous. If He doesn't come, we can play church. Right? If He doesn't come, we can have warm and fuzzy feelings, and I can try to give you a guilt trip, and I can try to lure you so we have a bunch of people come and pray. But if we don't have Him, nothing changes. If we don't have Him, nothing shakes up, nothing, nothing shifts, nothing's different. We've just played church and gone through the motions and done what we've always done, so we're going to get what we've always gotten. But when He comes, when His... When his presence really does begin to come, whoa, freedom comes, liberty comes. All those things that we looked at this morning begin to happen. He unleashes victory for us and, and the walls begin to come down and the prisoners are freed and the chains are broken off and, and miracles can begin to happen. Y'all believe miracles can still happen in the 21st century? You better because we need agreement that, it, that it's true. Because I believe he wants to do it in our midst. So here's what we did this morning and why we did it. I told the I told the our worship team I want to do most of our praise and worship at the end Sunday because I want to teach a little on praise and what it is and why it matters. And now what I want us to do is I want us to create an atmosphere of praise, right? I don't want us to just sing other people's songs. I don't want you to. Although it'd be cool if you sang the songs, right? But we're not going to stand here today and just be like the moment. Right? We're going to praise the Lord. We are going to praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We're going to praise Him. Right? And as we begin to praise Him, we're going to stand on the promises of His Word. Right? That Psalm 23 tells us that when we praise Him, He's enthroned on the praises of His people. Lord, we're creating a throne room right here. You'll be enthroned on our praises. You come and rest on and dwell on our praises. And as we begin to praise, and we begin to create an atmosphere of praise, He can move and He can do mighty things. So I want us to shake up our, our paradigms and our boxes and our mindsets of what church looks like and how we're supposed to do things. So today, we're not going to turn on a playlist and everybody come kneel and pray and hop up and leave. No, we're going to create an atmosphere of praise. Right? And different people might be doing different things. No, you do you. Right? You can put your eyes on Jesus if you do you. Right? We don't worry about that. Because we saw it's biblical. Right? Just physical manifestations of praise. And when the Spirit of God comes, look at it in the Word. It's messy. When the Spirit of God comes, it doesn't fit in the box. When the Spirit of God comes, it starts to shake things up and do things you haven't seen before, haven't seen for a while, or heard about it, thought we're freaky. He starts to do things. So we're going to create an atmosphere of praise. So as we sing uh, these songs this morning, would you do it from an attitude of praise? Would you just not constrain? Would you just not hold back? Would you just start to declare, maybe you don't have to sing somebody else's song, maybe you just need to shout it out, God, you're holy! God, you're good. And you just need to bless His name and start to do But would you just praise Him this morning? And I don't care if it's with a shout or an uplifted hand or the dance or on your knees or on your face, but would you just praise Him? We're going to create an atmosphere of praise because what do we see happens when we praise? Freedom comes. Right? So my second thing is we're, we're going to be a people of praise in this moment. But my second question is this, and I'm not asking for you to raise your hand or anything. Do you need freedom? Because if we're going to praise and we're going to say there's an atmosphere of freedom, then by golly, you need to come get your freedom. You, you need to come and get the freedom that God has for you. So as we, as we begin to praise and we begin to create an atmosphere of freedom, if there is something in your life that you need freedom from, would you come this morning and let us pray with you and get into agreement in the presence of God and He's breaking and giving you freedom? If, if there is an enemy coming against you, an attack, a thing that, that you need to help have a victory over, would you come and let God give you the victory like you did with Jehoshaphat? If, if there is a wall in your life, a wall around your heart, a wall around your mind, a stronghold, a thing in your life that needs to be torn down, as we praise and create an atmosphere of worship, would you come? 
And let us come and pray with you in agreement that there's, a, there's a, a, an atmosphere of freedom here and God is going to break those walls down. If you are bound in a prison, if you are bound in chains of any kind this morning, would you come this morning and understand that in the name of Jesus those chains break? That as we begin to create an atmosphere of praise, He wants to break those chains. Would you come and let us pray with you this morning and expect Him to move? This morning, if you need a miracle in your life, would you come and let us pray with you? have an expectation that as we begin to praise, He's going to do the miraculous. See, this is a moment, guys, when we've, we've got to stick, right? Because I've tried to show you in the Word, not my opinion, but what the Word says. I've tried to show you what the Word says about praise. So we've got it here. Now we've got to step into it. Yes. We can't just be content to say, well, I learned something about praise. Man, I understand praise better this morning. Okay. What are you going to do with it? Right? If we understand that we have this weapon of praise at our disposal, how could we not if we're in here this morning and we're chained, bound, broken, beat down, discouraged, attacked, how could we not come, understanding what praise does, how could we not come in an atmosphere of praise and say, I want my freedom and I'm not getting up till I have it. Why, why wouldn't we come and do that this morning? So this morning, I don't know what's going to happen. I believe people are going to get free. And you might have to praise your way to freedom. and You might have to come and let us agree with you and let God give you the freedom. But I want you walking out free. I believe the Lord wants you walking out free. Yes. I believe He doesn't want the church to be the most bound, beat down, discouraged people in the world. He wants us to be a people who walk in freedom. It's for freedom that He set us free. Are we going to walk in it? Are we going to get it? Are we, are we going to believe it and praise our way to it and come and find it? Or are we going to sit back and say, I don't know about all this. Think about what the Word said. Right? Think about what the Word said, what praise is, what those physical manifestations of praise are. And over and over, I just showed you three examples. There's more examples throughout the Bible where praise brought victory. I tried to show you Old Testament, Jehoshaphat, Joshua, New Testament, Paul and Silas. Every time when they praised, victory came. So would you stand this morning? And would you praise? Would you praise Him? Would you declare who He is? You don't have to sing these songs. You might just need to declare out and speak out who He is. You might need to lift up a shout. You might need to start telling Him His wondrous works. But if He saved you this morning, you need to pray. You need to praise and you need to declare what He's done for you. But this morning, if you've never been saved, you come right now. He wants to save you. There's an atmosphere of freedom. You're bound and, and, and captive to things. You're beat down in your mind. You feel like there's walls around your heart. You've got issues, problems, whatever they are. Whatever the issue is, I'm not even putting a box on it. You need something from the Lord, you come. Because He wants to give you freedom this morning. As we create an atmosphere of praise and freedom, He wants to give it to you. So this is a little different invitation, right? You might have to dodge some people to get here, but if you need your freedom, come get your freedom. Because we're going to praise you, but if you need something, you're going to come and find freedom. Don't stay back there and stay bound up. Don't stay back there and stay in your chains and stay in your prison and leave your walls there. Come get the freedom that He has for you this morning. Let's praise our way to freedom. The Lord spoke to me while you were preaching, and He said, was the, was the jailer's life worth it? Mm. I didn't hear that, Jay. Was the jailer's life worth it?
said, Josh said during his preaching that some of us have stopped on the sixth day walking around Jericho. You know, there was a time that there was a shift getting ready to take place in that jail cell. There was something, an atmosphere they were creating right before that atmosphere shifted. They had to press into it. Too many of us stop when the shift's getting ready to take place. Too many of us stop when the walls are starting to fall. Too many of us stop when the holes are there in the wall and it's beginning to crumble, but we stop before it's time for it to fall. Right now, we just need to make that shift. It takes a little press and it takes a little press and through to it. Make the shift in your life this morning. Make the shift in your personal life, but make the shift for your home this morning, for your family. Praise the Lord.
walked around those, or they marched around the walls of Jericho. They didn't know God as a believer until the walls fell. Amen. They didn't know, that prisoner didn't know God as Savior until his chains were broken. Sometimes it takes us, us pressing through so that people can recognize him for who he is. We don't know that part of God until we've experienced it for ourselves. Thank you.